Number 10, giant beaver skull. Big beavers, you say? All right, hit that thumbs up. So the Yukon permafrost, it seems to be a hot spot of sorts, as it should be. Lots of ancient animals just got stuck in time and of course in great condition, lucky for us. Scientific name for giant beavers back then was Castoroids ohinus. The giant beaver was on average larger than humans. As Jurassic Park as this thing looks, it only ate pond weeds. It was a gentle giant. He was a fan of the salads, it seems. Hold the beef. You would think otherwise looking at it. It looks like a monster. One of the largest rodents in history, rather. They were probably really cute. I'm not gonna lie, they look kinda nice, at least on Google. 50,000 years ago, they didn't chop down trees, just weeds. It's kinda nice. Smaller beavers outlived them once conditions warmed up. Like others on this list, they moved north. They followed the ideal conditions and that led them ultimately to their icy demise. That is, well, more often than not, the Yukon permafrost. Number nine, Inca mummies. Right off the hop, we got a three in one. Buckle up, folks. March 16th, 1999, right near the summit of Lilialaico, so around 7,000 meters up in the sky near Argentina and Chile borders. Right all the way up there, ancient history, it appears it was just waiting frozen in the cold. It was waiting in the form of three Inca mummies. Further studies found that they were most likely sacrificed in the name of some sort of religious Inca ritual around the year 1500 CE. It's quite a long time ago. They were found in a small opening less than two meters under the ground. Now again, this discovery was shocking. They looked like they were just asleep. That's what being frozen does to you. It makes your body look nice and fresh all the time. But in reality, they'd passed around you know, the 1500s. They're some of the most well-preserved mummies in the world. They now rest at an exhibition in the Museum of High Altitude Archaeology in Salta, Argentina. So if you're ever in Salta, there you go. Number eight, Surgeon Notebook. All right, all you nerds, get your old textbooks out for this one. Whenever explorers find notebooks, I'm always so interested. Even in video games, that's not even the boring mission for me, you know? I'm like, yeah, let's find those ancient scrolls. Let's do that first. It feels very national treasure to me to find ancient notes from somebody that they wrote. This notebook here once belonged to a surgeon a long time ago. It's over 100 years old, and it was found in a frozen hut in Antarctica. The owner was that of George Levick. He was a photographer and a surgeon who traveled with the last expedition of Robert Scott. Scott. This was from 1910 to 1913. Also, what a two for one combo. Guys, two amazing jobs, so different. The book itself was completely frozen shut and the bindings were toast, but the parts that they can read today is pretty historical. Thanks to that frozen stuff, it actually survived a lot of conditions. You can still read descriptions of photos George took at Cape Adair. That's, that's history right there. Number seven, Antarctica Pyramid. Okay, here we go, a little bit of alien stuff. Why not? Here on Bumblebee, we like talking about the pyramids of Egypt a lot. We're fascinated with all things ancient and history. Once I heard about pyramids in Antarctica, I had to know what was going on. This was back in 2016, where a mountain in Antarctica was trending online all of a sudden. Now, we all immediately thought it was evidence of an ancient civilization because, well, that's what we want to see, right? That's what we're hoping for every time we hit refresh on that history channel, page channel. Eric Rignot, a professor of Earth System Sciences at the University of California, reached out to live science when this was all unfolding. He added the quote, pyramid shapes are not impossible. Many peaks partially look like pyramids, but they only have one or two faces like that. Rarely four. So just a rare anomaly, just a rare frozen anomaly, or I don't know, maybe there's some frozen space aliens. Just... <sighs> Number six, Grasshopper Glacier. Yeah, if you aren't a fan of bugs, you can go ahead and skip to number five. I will not take it personally. Just hit the thumbs up at least, you know, do something. A glacier in Montana is home to thousands, millions, I don't even wanna know how many, grasshoppers and locusts, just all stuck in time right here. Yeah, imagine heading to a glacier and you forget bug spray, huh, what an idiot. Well, appropriately named Grasshopper Glacier, this mile-long glacier near Croke City holds the remains of extinct giant grasshoppers. Yeah, they're, they're dead and frozen and gone, but you can still see them, which is not great. These poor guys were traveling to find new life a long time ago, and they must have gotten caught up in some cold winds, and now they're stuck here for another few hundred years. This reminds me of those suckers that have the little insect inside. Who actually buys those, you know what I mean? You see them in gift shops a lot, scorpion inside, like, mm, nice. One lick and I'm done. Number five. Preserved wolf pup. When this little lady went into the ice 57,000 years ago, I bet she had no idea that she'd ever see the sun again. That's a long time ago. Discovered in, you guessed it, Yukon, Canada, Zur is the most complete wolf mummy that has ever been found. She's incredibly intact. She was discovered in 2016 by a gold miner while they were blasting water out of frozen mud. He was like, eh, hey, wait, wait, stop, hold on. And they found this. They thought it was treasure, but really it was just this little lady. 
Also treasured, you know, I take that back. She's also treasured. They did find treasure. X-rays tell us she was only six weeks old. X-rays also tell us that she was a fan of fish. That was her meal of choice. She loved eating fish. Poor thing, damn. I'm looking down like it's there. I'm like, ah, oh, we really missed you. All right, close the casket. Let's get out of here. Number four, frozen treasure. Here we go. Is it a wolf pup or is it actually a frozen treasure? Because Buddy's asking. As far as frozen treasure goes, this is very recent. You know, we don't find these often. Treasure frozen in ice, again, sounds like something out of a video game. I can't help it, this is so intriguing. Back in 2013, an anonymous mountain climber, can't imagine why they chose to stay hidden, they stumbled across a small box filled with jewels just jammed in the ice. Now, they had to breathe on it a little bit, you know, melt it out, pop it out a little bit, whatever. But once it was done, they reported it to French officers. Now this box contained around 100 precious gems. Precious gems. This was quite the find. Emeralds, sapphires, rupees, you name it. This box was worth 300,000 US dollars, roughly. I find a 20 on the ground, I'm like, that's it, I'm calling in sick. I find a toonie under the ice, I'm like, I'll wait, I'll wait till this melts. Well, since it was discovered on Mont Blanc, officials were able to trace down the lost gems back to an Air India flight that actually crashed on the mountain back in 1966. That's where this came from. The lives of 117 passengers were sadly lost, and because of the harsh conditions, it's been next to impossible to have recovered anything from the mountain, especially that long ago, right? No one wants to climb and do any of that. It's impossible. Now, somehow, these family gems were able to see light again as well. And yes, the owner did return the gems. Thing is, two families claimed the goods. I'm surprised there's not more, to be honest with you. Interestingly enough, in 2014, a French treasure hunter, Daniel Roche, found 50 more pieces of jewelry from the same glacier. So, yeah, some glaciers are filled with bugs, other glaciers filled with gems. So, 50-50, really, you never know what you're gonna get. Just lick and hope. Actually, don't do that, that's gonna get a sore throat. Number three, the glacier girl. Before you get worried, no, this next one is not a real person at any time. The next one here is a plane, a P-23 aircraft to be specific, who was discovered in Greenland, surrounded of course in ice. Now, during World War II in July 1942, six P-38 fighter planes were ordered to make an emergency landing in Greenland due to lousy weather conditions and of course, low visibility. The crew was saved, but the Lockheed had to be abandoned, never to be seen again for 50 years. It was then dug out of a 264 feet bank of snow and ice, and it took years to finally get this plane back out. She's known now as the Glacier Girl, and in 2007, Lewis Energy CEO, Rodney Lewis, he bought that plane. Can you imagine having that kind of money? You're buying ancient frozen planes? Like, it doesn't work, you know that, right? All right, cool, rich guys. Number two, blood red waterfall. We've all seen that video or photo of the waterfall that's underwater. It's a nice little optical illusion. Looks kind of scary. Never want to swim again after seeing that. The blood red waterfall is a little more jarring. On the southern side of our planet, there's a waterfall in Antarctica that is blood red. It is haunting to look at. I, I don't ever want to see this in person or on the internet again, for that matter. The edge of Taylor Glacier, great name for a glacier, my God. This is a one of a kind waterfall that pours into Lake Bonnie. So millions of years ago, when sea levels rose up, glaciers now naturally formed at the top of the lake. So this melting water that's slowly leaking out from a quarter mile deep, this water is now three times saltier and three times as scary to look at. When the iron rich water then reached the air, it looked bloody. I mean, more than fair, just seeing photos of this, it's, it's jarring, it looks like there's a lot of healthy iron pouring out of there. Number one, fish eat fish. This one's kind of funny, you know, funny timing, we gotta finish on a nice, is that a real photo? We gotta finish on one of those. If you know anything about me, it's that I'm not a fan of lakes, or oceans, or anything underwater, I'm good. Land, beaches, plains, perfect, let's do that. This video went viral not too long ago, and it is very real. These two brothers were fishing on Indiana's Wawasee Lake, and they saw a pike eating a bass, only both parties were completely still, because they were both already dead, and both completely frozen. Mid-meal, guy's got a fish in his mouth, frozen in time. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. We found this, this is a real thing. They posted the original photo and nobody believed that it was real. So they had to follow up and post the video where they actually remove it from the ice. So totally official. I would also think this is fake too. It looks like a meme that you'll have in the back of a class where it's like, hey, always a bigger fish, don't give up or something weird like that. Like Will Smith with a thumbs up next to like a glacier. You're like, is this motivation? I don't know, this is weird. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Bobby, Eddie, and David. When Bobby Shafran was 19 years old, he found out he had a twin, a brother named Eddie. The two were raised separately because they had been adopted at birth into different households. Not too long after finding out about each other, things took an even crazier twist when Bobby and Eddie 
Betty found out that they had a triplet, another brother named David. What should have been a very joyous reunion for the triplets turned very dark when they began to uncover the truth about what happened and why they had spent all of those years not knowing the others existed. As it turns out, they found out they were forced to be subjects of an experiment they had no idea was taking place. Peter Neubauer was a child psychiatrist who wanted to study nature versus nurture, but decided to do it in this cruel and unethical way. He believed that twins or triplets had a better chance of thriving if they were separated from their twin, and he wanted to prove this by unknowingly separating twins from each other at birth. Luckily, Bobby, Eddie, and David all found each other, and their story is documented in the movie Three Identical Strangers. In our number nine spot today, we have the Milgram experiment. The premise of this experiment was that they took two groups of people, one called teachers and one called learners, and they paired them up, one from each group. The pair couldn't see each other, but the teacher would ask the learner a question. If the learner got it wrong, the teacher was then told to give them an electric shock. Every question made the shocks get worse until an eventual fatal shock would be administered. Before the experiment, it was proposed that only 3% of the participants would go all of the way and actually give the fatal shock. But it turned out that under pressure, 65% of the teachers actually gave the lethal dose of electricity to their learner counterparts. Luckily, the students were actually just actors, so no one was truly getting hurt or shocked to death in this experiment. But it honestly is very creepy and very disturbing to see these poor people being pushed so far past their boundaries, and it's kind of unsettling to know the results. In our number eight spot today, we have the Hoffling Hospital Experiment. This experiment happened all the way back in 1966, in a time where the rules of psychological experiments were a lot more loosey-goosey. Because of this, the nurses that were all a part of this experiment had no idea that they were participants, which nowadays is very, very illegal. Basically, this experiment took place on the night shift. The night nurse would receive a phone call during the shift, and on the other end would be Dr. Smith, who's actually a researcher. He would ask the nurses to check the medicine cabinet to see if they had a drug called astrotin, which was actually a drug that was just made up for this experiment, and it was just a placebo. The astrotin would clearly state the maximum dosage of 10 milligrams, but Dr. Smith would ask the nurses to administer 20 milligrams. They were told that the doctor was in a hurry and he would sign all of the authorization papers as soon as he came in to see the patient later on that night. If the nurse decided to give the patient the drug, they would be breaking three rules. They are not allowed to accept instructions over the phone, the dose was double the maximum limit stated on the box, and the medicine itself was unauthorized. It was not on the ward stock list, so it shouldn't be in use at the hospital. Out of the 22 unknowing nurse participants, 21 of them administered the drug. That's insane. This isn't to say that the nurses were bad people or that they were bad at their job, but this experiment combined with the interviews that happened afterwards just showed how the power imbalance and the social pressures that come along with that can affect the outcome of a workplace extremely drastically, and in this case, it really could have been a matter of life and death. In our number seven spot today, we have the facial expressions experiment. In 1924, a psychologist with the University of Minnesota, Carney Landis, wanted to conduct an experiment to study facial expressions. More specifically, he wanted to see if everyone's expressions of emotions were the same. Does happiness look the same on everyone? Does sadness, shock, disgust, etc. make us all react the same way facially? An interesting question for sure, but the method was strange. Basically, he recruited some student volunteers and then painted the lines of their facial muscles black. He then exposed each participant to different stimuli in order to photograph their reactions and then, of course, compare the results. This is all fine, except for what the stimuli actually contained. I guess this guy just really wanted big reactions because he included showing them adult films, exposing them to ammonia, making them touch reptiles, and even beheading rats. Apparently, one third of the participants willingly did this beheading when told despite not knowing how to do it humanely, and even if they did know how to do it humanely, why would you? And for the two thirds that were regular and did not just behead a rat because a strange man told them to, unfortunately, Carney did it for them. I'm not even sure what the results of this experiment were, and I have to ask, does it even matter? What an actual nightmare for something that largely just doesn't really have an impact on our lives. In our number six spot today, we have telephone cats. Sorry to all the cat people out there, this one isn't going to be for you. In 1929, two scientists at Princeton University wanted to conduct an experiment in order 
order to test how auditory nerves perceive sounds. This is obviously extremely important research, but the way they went about it is very messed up. They took a sedated but alive cat and cut out part of its brain. They then attached one end of a telephone wire to the cat's auditory nerve and the other end to a receiver. When one of these scientists spoke into the cat's ear, the other one could hear it on the other end. This is cool, but most definitely not an excuse to do something so inhumane. There were benefits of this experiment of course, and it is believed that it may have helped lead to the development of cochlear implants, which is of course an incredibly important scientific advancement. The worst part however, while the cat actually survived this experiment, instead of treating it like a king for the rest of its life like it truly deserved, these scientists instead killed it to see if the experiment would still work on a dead cat. It didn't. In our number 5 spot today we have the pit of despair. This experiment the experiment was conducted by Henry Harlow and is one of the most controversial on this list. In a sort of mental health study, Henry decided to induce depression in monkeys. He took very young monkeys and separated them from their peers and mothers and put them into isolation in a cage that was called the pit of despair. Sometimes the monkeys would stay there for longer, more extended periods, and other times they would be repeatedly separated and put into the cage for multiple shorter stays. These monkeys all proved to be extremely psychologically disturbed after the conclusion of this experiment, which should have seemed kind of obvious even before the experiment was conducted. These monkeys were used as a model of human clinical depression, but here's where things get even sadder than they already were. These monkeys were unable to be treated and rehabilitated. Despite various forms of treatment, they were just unable to get to a place they would have been had they not have been subject to a cruel experiment. In our number 4 spot today we have psychic driving. A part of Project MK Ultra, this experiment was conducted by British psychiatrist Donald E. Ewan Cameron, who created the psychic driving concept that the CIA found interesting. Basically, psychic driving was a procedure that subjects patients to a continuous, repeated audio loop of something that is intended to change their behavior. Basically, the patients would be exposed to hundreds of thousands of repetitions of a singular statement through the course of their treatment, and they would also be subjected to paralytic drugs that would subdue them while being exposed to this looped message. Yeah, so the CIA heard about this idea for a treatment and thought, hmm, that sounds cool. Then they started sending money to fund Cameron's experiments, but he actually didn't know it was coming from the CIA because they used a front. So Cameron's psychic driving experiments for MK Ultra began to take place in Canada. I guess they said that the aim of the experiments were to get rid of or cure someone of schizophrenia by erasing existing memories and reprogramming the psyche. I'm not sure that's how schizophrenia works, but I guess they did. Cameron would subject patients to paralytic drugs and electroconvulsive therapy that was 30 to 40 times the normal power. He would also put the experiment subjects into induced comas while exposing them to the repeated audio. The experiments were mostly conducted on patients who entered the institute for more common problems like anxiety disorders or postpartum depression, and they ended up leaving with permanent effects from his actions. These included things like urinary incontinence, amnesia, being unable to speak. Some people forgot their parents and thought that the interrogators were their parents. It clearly completely completely alter those who are participating in these horrible and certainly unethical experiments. In our number 3 spot today we have the UCLA schizophrenia experiments. Starting in 1983, UCLA researchers Michael Gitlin and Keith Nocherlin went to great and very unethical lengths to see just how people who were suffering from schizophrenia relapse. Basically they were trying to figure out if there was a way to predict the relapse or a psychosis episode, and this is definitely important work that deserves attention because it could certainly have real world benefits, but that does does not mean unethical lengths should be reached. Unfortunately, this experiment involved recruiting hundreds of participants who were all being treated for schizophrenia and then taking them off of their medication. This alone has some obvious implications for the health of these people, but to make matters worse, there was no suitable plan in place for when they could return to their medication, and they also just didn't do a good enough job making sure that those participating were protected and safe given their very vulnerable state. Unfortunately, the results were disastrous and proved to be fatal when one of the participants participants, Antonio La Madrid, ended up taking his own life. In an article from 1994, it also says that the doctors failed to get proper informed consent from the patients as well. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Tuskegee Experiment. In the years between 1932 and 1972, there were 399 black impoverished farmers in Tuskegee, Alabama who all had syphilis who were recruited to participate in a free program. They were told that the program would help them treat their ailment, but of course, that never happened. This experiment 
experiment was conducted by people who were trying to see what would happen if the disease went untreated. Instead of treating the men with penicillin, which was the recommended treatment at the time, the men received aspirin and mineral supplements as placebos. And while this experiment was conducted to try and understand what effect the spread of disease has on the body, the unethical considerations of the scientists who conducted it proved to be absolutely fatal and just downright cruel. Out of the 399, 28 of them passed away from the disease directly, 10 passed away from complications related to the disease, 40 spouses became infected, which was then passed on to 19 others at birth whose parents had been infected. This whole situation truly is one of those times where you stop and wonder how these things were ever treated as acceptable and really just hope that things have changed for the better. In our number one spot today, we have Unit 731. The Imperial Japanese Army's Unit 731 conducted some pretty horrifying experiments during World War II that certainly are shocking to anyone who hears about them. The experiments were meant to be done as a way to prepare for biological warfare, but the process was gruesome and just inhumane. Different medical schools and universities provided doctors and other research staff to help conduct these experiments, and they used both prisoners and civilians as the guinea pigs. There were a bunch of different experiments that were conducted during this time, some of which involved injecting them with pathogens such as plague or cholera or anthrax. Others involved vivisection or operations with no anesthesia, putting them in a pressure chamber to see how much a human can withstand before bursting, or even live weapons testing. It is hard to even believe that this was a real thing that happened, and we honestly can't even begin to imagine what those people were forced to face during that time. Kicking off our list at number 10, Alan Hill's Meteorite. All right, this one's for all the space nerds. This next one is literally out of this world. Back in December 1984, American meteor hunters discovered this fragment in Allen Hills, Antarctica. Now this meteor was appropriately named Allen Hills 48001, which is, okay, let's break to the point. Now this rock was speculated to come from Mars. And in 1996, a scientist claimed that he discovered bacteria from the microscopic fossils on this meteorite. Now the news of course spread quickly and everybody started to lose their minds. You know, rightfully so, this is a while ago. Bill Clinton even chimed in. He made a speech about possible discoveries in space with aliens and sh The scientific community later said this was not the case after further studies, but never say never. Feels like we're getting closer to finding life now with James Webb. I don't know, every time I click refresh, it's like, check out this thing that's in the past. I'm like, what? Number nine, Western Camel Bones. Scientific name being Camelops hesternus, meaning yesterday's camel in Latin. There's a fun fact. Now these bones first appeared in 2008 when gold miners were working in Hunter Creek. It was only 60 miles away from the Alaskan border. When all of a sudden they stumbled across these massive bones, ancient bones. The last time these bones were operating on, you know, actual limbs, was 75 to 125,000 years ago. Isn't that incredible? The remains were in such great condition because of the awful surrounding conditions. It was so cold that scientists could actually still extract DNA, which told us that 10 million years ago, roughly, Western camels split from modern day camels. Yeah, we had more camels, now we don't have many camels. Sads. The more camels, the better. Number eight, more meteorites. For this one, we'll switch it up. This time, scientists found ice in meteorite. Nice, it's always a good time. James Webb is about to hopefully show us how much water is in space, and I personally am not ready for it. Back in 1990, after the 094 meteorite was discovered in the Algerian mountains, the rock was dated back to 4.6 billion years ago. So scientists studied the meteorite with synchrotron radiation-based x-ray nanotomography, leading scientists to find evidence of tiny pores. Pores believed to have been fossilized ice crystals. That's fun, that's, again, space aliens with water. Who knows, hopefully. These pores have come from when the meteorite crossed the snow line in space. Now the snow line is a sphere around the sun. It's the exact point where ice on meteorites melts. It's pretty cool. The study was to hopefully find out where water comes from in that galaxy, and it seems that it came from a lot further than we all thought, which is comforting, I guess. Yeah, there's water in space, it's just, you know, way the fuck out there. Number seven, viruses. We're all talking about an ancient virus that's coming back now, some ancient mummified frozen virus. Sounds like we're doomed. Just over a year ago in China, scientists discovered an ancient virus. These samples came from the Tibetan Plateau, and the samples were originally collected back in 2015. Now the contents date back to around 14,400 years ago, long before Captain America went into the ice. And there's dust, gases, and of course, viruses over that long accumulated time, and glaciers just soaked it all in, right? 
layer after layer pushing history deeper into its icy core until scientists come in with a few mega drills. Now we're finding dinosaurs, we're finding bones, and also sometimes we find 33 viruses. Yeah, 33, that's like two more than my family computer had growing up. That's a lot of viruses. Four of these viruses typically infect bacteria and the rest were novel, which means that it's never been seen before. Yeah, how neat is that? Novel viruses, just what the world needs right now. Number six, Otzi the Iceman. Discovered in September 1991, this mummy was found on the border of Austria and Italy. He's Europe's oldest known natural mummy. It's pretty amazing. He was covered in ice shortly after his death, so most of the 45-year-old man from the Copper Age was left in rather good condition. A 5,000-year-old man was found in ice. You know, you lose this round, Captain America. Again, I'm just saying. I really thought I'd put you on this list. Not this time. Before we passed in the Italian Alps, Otzi had a number of health problems, it seems, that we've now found many years later. He had arthritis, Lyme disease, and he was lactose intolerant. Thanks to science, we now know that Otzi the Iceman was sharpening his tools right before his death. So, he fought till the end. What an OG. Number five, underneath Thwaites Glacier. We've seen some fascinating stuff here on B. You know, I do my best, specifically underwater footage. I know that gives us all the creeps. We love exploring the deeps for some reason. And this next one, I couldn't believe, honestly. You're about to see footage from the bottom of an Antarctic glacier, so buckle up. This glacier is the size of Florida, so if it collapses at any point in our time, our sea levels could rise 10 feet. And in 2019, researchers drilled 2,300 feet through the middle of Thwaites Glacier. Then they dropped a robot with a camera right down and they saw this. For the first time ever, we've now seen the grounding zone of Thwaites Glacier. Lead scientist Brittany Schmidt says this project is a dream come true, and I can't agree more. It's her walking on the moon moment, and I could not agree more. This feels like another universe, almost. This looks like the upside down. This is terrifying. There's only one meter of space between the bottom of the glacier and the rocky seafloor, so think about that when you sleep tonight. Number four. Message in a bottle. Back in 1959, a geologist named Paul Walker, no, not that one, not even close, he decided to bury a message in a bottle. And he wanted to make a lasting statement about climate change, so he put this frozen message underneath rocks near a glacier in 1959, and then cut to 2013, well, what do we find again? We find Paul Walker's message in a bottle. The message inside was measurements, and to be exact, it was the length from the exact point of the bottle to the edge of a nearby glacier. But by 2013, many, many years later, said glacier had shrunk down 200 feet, so now the glacier was much further. A lasting statement indeed, I would say. Good call, Paul Walker. Number three. Ice Age art. More ancient artwork, but this time we're going to the Colombian Amazon. Now the thing is, unlike other drawings found in the ceilings of tombs or anything like that, this frozen canvas stretches about eight miles. It's incredible. The paintings inside, they're even more impressive. Dating back to 12,000 years ago, these were made near the end of the last Ice Age. Thousands of paintings, by the way, not just a handful of arrows, nothing like that, just a huge canvas. These were found in 2017, so pretty recently, but it was only last year where they finally went public with these Arctic findings. Now the findings being, you know, paintings of elephants, massive sloths, horses from the Ice Age, snakes, birds, deer, that kind of stuff. This is now one of the largest collections of rock art in South America. Yeah, pregnant women or the origins of the Ninja Turtles? I don't know, I'm on the fence, you tell me. Number two, the Glacier Girl. Now before you get worried, no, this next one is not a real person, this next one is a plane. A P-23 aircraft was discovered in Greenland surrounded in ice. Now during World War II in July 1942, six P-38 fighter planes were ordered to make an emergency landing in Greenland due to lousy weather conditions and of course, low visibility. Now the crew was thankfully saved, but the Lockheed had to be abandoned, never to be seen again for now 50 years. Recently it was dug out of 264 feet of snow and ice. It took years to get this plane back up, but now she of course is known as the Glacier Girl, and in 2017, Lewis Energy CEO Rodney Lewis, he bought this plane. Yeah, they just brought a plane out of the ice, and this guy's like, yeah, I'll buy it, debit, no problem. And finally, number one, a preserved mammoth cub. In 2010, a mummified mammoth cub was discovered in Siberia, right off the coast of Oyogos, named after a nearby village, Yuka, this newfound cub, is now the best preserved mammoth cub discovered in history. Now this was a fascinating find that should have never been seen again, let alone found in such great condition. It's kind of haunting when you look at it, it still looks alive, you know what I mean? But apparently that's not the end of woolly mammoths. Who knew? It was announced only months ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a company called Colossal, they're now planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. For 
reasons, you know, for science reasons. The last mammoth to walk the planet alive was around 10,500 years ago, but what if they were alive today? Colossal raised over $15 million and now they're working on reviving that woolly mammoth. They're doing this to ideally decelerate the melting of the Arctic permafrost and to save modern elephants from extinction and of course to advance CRISPR editing. We love science, maybe a little too much, I don't know. Is it a good idea to bring the woolly mammoth back to life or are we just, I don't know, setting them up for another slow, horrible demise once again? Starting our list off at number 10, super glue. I feel like we're using super glue now more than ever in history. Activists are gluing themselves to tables, streets, you name it. But who do we have to thank for such a sticky substance? Back in 1942, inventor Dr. Harry Coover was working on plastic sites for weapons. Now, this was intended to help Allied forces during World War II, but while working on these clear plastic sites, he made super glue instead. Now, obviously, he was a little busy at the time, so he shelved this invention for nine years before returning back to the lab. Superglue didn't completely come out until 1958. It took 16 years to get to our shelves. And it's still there. We use superglue to fix everything. Even the occasional social issue, it appears. Number nine, microwave. I can't say microwave anymore. I have to say microwave because of this video. Milk, full fat, which I've warmed in the microwave. Thanks to this first invention on our list today, I can eat Hot Pockets anytime I want. Not all inventions allow you to accomplish such a feat. Percy Spencer changed the science and snack game. He was originally an American engineer working for Raytheon, but Percy also loved a snack on the site. So he had a chocolate bar in his pocket one day. He was saving it for later, but when he walked in front of a magnetron, the chocolate bar in his pocket, well, it sadly melted. But luckily for us, after a few follow-up experiments in 1945, we now get microwave ovens. And it's always a good time. It wasn't until 1967, mind you, where microwaves were in our actual homes, because of course it took a little while to narrow down. But yeah, nowadays it's great. We almost forget we have one now. It's perfect. Number eight, pacemaker. Here we go, this one's a tad more exciting than super glue, dare I say. A pacemaker, odds are you know somebody with one of these right now. It all started in 1956, when Wilson Greatbach was trying to record the rhythm of the heart. Not the song, the actual rhythm of the actual heart. That's the dumbest joke I've ever put in anything in my entire life. But after installing the wrong piece by mistake, he actually realized that the circuit was emitting these pulses, these heartbeat type pulses. So he thought, well, maybe I can create a device small enough for a body and actually stimulate an actual heartbeat. Cut to 1958, a dog was the first ever proud owner of one pacemaker. He's walking around, he's like, hey, life's rough. Number seven. Theory of evolution. Charles Darwin, we don't think of this man too often for obvious reasons, but he had some ideas that were out there, right? In his book, The Origin of Species, written back in 1859, he explained how humans were evolved from the animal kingdom. And as if that wasn't already a handful of news, he also claimed that the world was much, much older than what everybody thought. And around the 1930s, that crazy idea was then accepted into the scientific community officially. Imagine being the first person to be like, I think we came from animals. I don't think we're uh, aliens. I think we're actually, I think we're actually animals. That's a hot take, right? Number six, oxygen. Okay, speaking of hot takes, again, imagine being the first person to be like, what is this? What am I breathing right now? Why is this so good? What is oxygen? What is all this gas around us? Pretty hot take. That's a pretty bold thing to just dive into. Oxygen was identified for the first time scientifically by Joseph Priestley back in 1774. After he heated up red mercuric oxide, he found this colorless gas, and at first he called it deflagisticated air, which is, you know, it doesn't roll off the tongue per se. And Priestley shared his discovery with the French scientist Antoine Lavoisier. Lavoisier then connected these dots, and we learned that oxygen supports animal life. And us too, we don't mind air. Air's pretty, that's pretty nice. Number five not flat. Let's talk about the Earth for a hot second, shall we? Any guesses as to what shape it is? I'll tell you one thing, it's certainly not flat. Definitely not a flat planet. We can hit that thumbs up for not a flat Earth. We've known this since 1619, when Johann Kepler published the third law of planetary motion. Now this, this was a glorious day for the scientific community. This is when humans finally figured out that the Earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around and also circular. That's also a great point to learn at the same time, that it's not flat, for sure not flat, definitely a circle. If you're a flat earther, hit that thumbs up. We're learning today, you know? Number four, 
Velcro. All right, shout out to every guy out there with a Velcro wallet. Keep doing it, man. I still have mine from high school. I'll never abandon that thing ever in my life. It's still got, it's still got some stick left in them. Who must we thank for Velcro? I use Velcro every day. I use them on my rock climbing shoes so I don't fall off the wall. And it's all thanks to a Swiss engineer named George de Mestral. And back in 1941, he found these burrs clinging to his pants and his dog's fur. He went for a walk and then he was covered in all those spiky balls. That's the worst day, eh? that happens so often. We've all been there, but we've certainly never been inspired like George was. The word Velcro is actually a combination of velvet and crochet. Now these are artificial hooks that stick on your clothes. They were heavily used by NASA first in the 1960s. And then for us, of course, when we weren't ready to tie our shoes. Number three, the discovery of penicillin. Sometimes miracles happen when nobody's even in the room, right? It's like boiling water or something like that. You have to look away. A watched pot never boils. It certainly does though, you know? Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin back in 1928. Now at the time, he was actually studying Staphylococcus, bacteria that causes infections and boils and nasty stuff. But right before Alexander left for a two week vacation, he left a Petri dish with some of that Staphylococcus just on the lab table rather than stored away in an incubator. Turns out everybody here needed alone time because during this off time, a penicillium mold spore just got the confidence to introduce itself to said bacteria. And now the, the room's temperature was also perfect. It was a lovely moment for everybody involved. Plus the emptiness of the room allowed for the mold to finally fight back in peace and prevent that bacteria from growing furthermore. He discovered this antibacterial substance was only produced by strains of penicillium. Guy's like, all right, see you in two weeks. Comes back to a literal miracle. It's like, what? Number two, the Trinity test. Not all of these are Velcro and fun and games, okay? Some science discoveries suck. When Americans heard that Germans were developing nuclear weapons, they joined in with their development on a project, most of it being done in New Mexico. So in 1939, President Roosevelt got scientists, military officials, this whole team of brilliant individuals to figure out how to use uranium as a weapon. The government eventually started to fund said research, which was happening at Columbia University. And in 1942, engineers from the army joined in as well. And following Pearl Harbor, that's when President Roosevelt transitioned the project into a military branch officially, the Manhattan Project, made with the strict goal of weaponizing nuclear energy. There are facilities in New Mexico, Tennessee, Washington, even here in Canada, you name it. But come July 16th, 1945, the Trinity test was conducted. The first atomic weapon was detonated in a New Mexico desert and it was deemed a success with mushroom clouds reaching as high as 40,000 feet. It was, uh, yeah, that was definitely life-changing, for sure. And finally, number one, Coca-Cola. All right, we'll finish on a nice sweet note. Let's do it. Every time it's the holiday season, I see nothing but Coca-Cola ads. I don't know how they do it. They've somehow tapped into the entire holiday season. But how does such a syrup come to be in the first place? We'll end on this one so we can all grab a drink immediately after the video ends. I got you, I know how to do this. Inventor and pharmacist John Pemberton originally set out to cure headaches, which is pretty ironic. Two main ingredients, of course, being coca leaves and cola nuts. Now, things were boring, dare I say, until his lab assistant accidentally mixed the two with carbonated water. And then, poof, it's a miracle. It's like they knew, it's like they were from the future and they're like, hey, Trust me, I got us. Over time, you throw in this top secret recipe, which we still don't know, and now we have a movie theater essential. And one of my favorite soft drinks, Coca-Cola. Personally, actually, I'm lying. I'm a Dr. Pepper guy, if anything. 23 flavors? How in the world do they get it in that little can? If we get a part two, I'll throw Dr. Pepper in. There you go. Number 10, spider art. I have to start our list off with NASA's 1995 spider tests. I was always afraid of spiders growing up, and. Once I heard about this, it kind of helped out. So I don't know, maybe I'll help you as well. When nature meets science, we often get jarring results, be it hybrid animals, clones, you name it. Spiders, as fascinating as they already are, can be even more mysterious, believe it or not, especially when they're exposed to mind-altering illicit substances. NASA wanted to determine the toxicity between these substances and what differences they may look like in, you know, in use. So spiders, being as fascinating as they are, we can see how they think and survive with their webs. We see it up close, you know, when we accidentally walk through them and we go, Ew. But we never see them like this, right? Caffeinated behavior is all over the place, right? It doesn't even look like a normal web at all. But with hallucinogens, it's the same shape, but it's almost missing steps. I don't think any animal should have coffee. I don't think an espresso goes well with a bug or a human, really. Number nine, the turkey fake out. 
This next one here is pretty funny. I had to include it. Back in the 1960s, turkey biologists in Pennsylvania thought, what if a male turkey was in a room with a fake turkey? What would happen, right? Would he try and flirt, right? Let's see what happens. Would he I am legend this fake turkey and just continue on living like everything's normal? Yes, turns out the answer is yes. These male turkeys would actually try and mate with the fake turkey, but by the end of the tests, they just had a head of a turkey on a stick. A fake turkey also, not, that'd be horrible. But these dudes still came out like, hey, what's going on, you single? Even though it was a stick with a photo of a turkey. These guys had no idea. How funny is that? They were just slowly taking away parts of a real turkey and these dudes were coming out still with the same, with the same game plan, with the same keys to the VIP plan to get with that turkey, even though it's a broom. Number eight, Zors. It's a fun one to say, let's do it. Zors, it's a great word, Zors. Male zebra, female horse. Now we get a really fun word, the Zors. Sounds like a god, Thor Odin and Zors. Zebroids are also quite common historically. See, Charles Darwin even noted some in his early work. So since the 19th century, crossbreeding zebras with horses or donkeys, it's all been done. More often than not, and this is what makes them stand out, zebroids will experience dwarfism. Yeah, they're quite cute, I can't lie. In 2010, a zedonk was born, a zebra donkey, but again, back in the 70s, three were born in Colchester Zoo. Yeah, way back then, probably forgot about that. These zookeepers were like, huh, how do we make the zoos new and hip? Oh, I have an idea. Yeah, bizarre, humans aren't too smart. Let's stop mixing animal DNA. We get pretty jarring results all the time, I think. Number seven, inner armor. All right, let's change it up a little bit, shall we? DARPA's Inner Armor Project. This was the Pentagon's way of creating super soldiers. Yeah, in Marvel Phase 5 or whatever, couldn't be a better time to bring this out. Scientists use animals as a reference for these new abilities, like literally from a Marvel movie. They're studying the DNA of the stellar sea lion because it can reduce blood flow away from organs if need be in order to reduce oxygen demand to survive. Yeah, that's like a superpower. We gotta figure that out. That would be sweet. Just Aquaman with a tactical vest? Okay, sure, let's do it. Dr. Michael Callahan, who is in charge of running the operation, says that the goal is to make soldiers kill-proof against disease, chemical weapons, radioactive weapons, harsh weather conditions, you name it, all that stuff. Now, this was back in 2007. And then later in 2014, Barack Obama just came out of nowhere and announced that the United States is working on building Iron Man. Yeah, apparently that wasn't uh, a joke. Number six, the Milgram experiment. All right, we gotta turn it up a little bit, shall we? While learning about our past in further detail, like the Trinity test, for example, and how that led to the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's important to understand why these things happened and how people like the Germans were so easily influenced into doing what they did. So the Milgram experiment was put in place to start getting some ideas, right? How far will people go when it comes to obeying instructions, specifically if it involves a third party being hurt? Stanley Milgram, Yale psychologist, he created this test, and there's three important roles for this one. There's the teacher, the experimenter, and the learner. The learner is disguised as the main test subject, but they're really in on the whole thing. The real subject is actually the teacher, the one administering pain to the test subject. Yeah, they're told by this higher figure or whatever to keep upping the pain every time they get a question wrong. So the real test is to see how far humans will go when hurting others. The icing on this experiment, of course, is that the subject isn't actually getting shocked at all. These tests were underway in 1961 in a basement at Yale University. Imagine taking the wrong turn on your way to class, you end up here, it's terrible. Number five, go pills. Okay, look out, five hour energy. We're pulling an all nighter for this one. Every time I watch Lord of the Rings, I fall asleep. I can't help it, it's a lovely film, but it's so cozy. The music, you know, just tucks me in and I'm gone. Also, it's like four and a half hours, so, you know, it's not my fault. But that's not an issue in the real world, is it? No, overnight truck drivers struggling to stay awake to pay the bills, that's a bit more important, I'd say. And that's where go pills were supposed to come into play. The pill that keeps you up for 40 hours Straight, yeah, doesn't that sound like a nightmare? What the hell? The US Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, again, DARPA, is currently funding this pill. The benefits it would have, I gotta say, if this thing works, I'm kinda on board, honestly. Like I finally play 50 turns in a single round of Mario Party without having to sleep in between. It can finally be done. Or Monopoly, I can do one round of Monopoly, finally. Number four, chimpanzee human. Also referred to as a human Z. Sounds awfully terrifying right off the bat. Look, here are the facts, people. We are very close to chimpanzees. Around 98% of our DNA is shared with that of a chimpanzee. That's why we look awfully familiar. 
with our hands and beautiful eyes. Back in the 1920s, we got closer than ever. A human Z was not just a fantasy. Soviet biologist Ilya Ivanov inseminated female chimps with DNA, but it didn't work. Or did it? See, things got questionable when a chimp named Oliver hit the scene later in the 70s. He was walking like a human, referred to as the missing link because of his appearance. Yet he was previously a performance animal, he was a show chimp, so not a hybrid, but many viewed these experiments as immoral back in the day. Which is odd, because I remember seeing chimps in family movies. I remember seeing like most extreme primate, where he's doing like skateboard tricks, where he's like snowboarding all of a sudden. Airbud as well, I don't know. What made these animals do all these sports? You know what I mean? Number nine, lions. Back in the 80s at the Chatbir Zoo in India, they started an experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller and has a less shaggy mane, with an African lion in the hopes that they could, you know, be introduced into the wild and help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. Sounds like a great plan on paper. Sure, here we go, that's a step forward. But is it? No. The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus and then brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. Now when the cubs were born, it was clear that this was already a grave mistake as the cubs already had severely weak back legs. They couldn't even walk. They were having extreme trouble walking and as they got older, their immune systems started to fail. And by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these hybrid lions and they finally decided to stop the program and all the males were given mastectomies in order to stop any further reproduction ever. Thing is, there are laws that prohibited them from killing animals. So they were simply just waiting around for them to die off naturally. Yeah, when there's a dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they wasted 20 years trying to do this when they could have just simply bred lions that they had. I don't know. Number two, Pyrenean ibex. The Pyrenean ibex also went extinct. Now this time, much sooner than mammoths. Actually around 2000, period. Not 2000 years ago, like 2000 of the year. Yeah, the last one was a female named Celia and a falling tree sadly killed her. Of all the ways to go, really? That's just brutal. A subspecies of the Spanish ibex, the Pyrenean ibex, were native to the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of Spain and France. Now, back in the medieval ages, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level. You know, knights and sword, you know, knights and swords equals lunch. We now have lunch. So the numbers dipped, okay? More than fair, we got armies to feed, yada yada. But in 2009, science was ready for the Pyrenean ibex to return. Okay, that's a little odd. It was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven minutes. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. Lung complications are why the clone ultimately didn't survive, but we had a hybrid medieval animal back for seven minutes. We're getting close. To what? Not really sure, but we're getting close to something. And finally, number one the Kunga, perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing ever. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that once roamed ancient Mesopotamia. Now, this was a time before even horses were on this land, right? This was a long time ago. So they had to do something. Large Kungas would pull wagons and smaller ones would help pull plows. These little guys were the talk of the town. Imagine a hybrid animal before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol, let's go. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Yummy. Uh, I wonder if this is a kunga. It smells like a kunga. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. It was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. Yeah, just a wild hybrid ass. It's pretty insane what you can still learn from ancient animal bones even from thousands of years ago. It's fascinating. More amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. I don't know, should we bring back the kunga? Imagine seeing this thing in a farm, just pulling something. Number 10, Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Dean Mitchell was a US Navy officer, aviator, test pilot, engineer, NASA astronaut, and of course, ufologist. Ufology is the pseudo term for somebody who studies UFOs. I don't think there's like a degree you can just get that in. If so, where? I'm signing up. Just needed a name for it, I guess? I don't know. The lunar module pilot of Apollo 14 in 1971, guy clocked nine hours working on the moon. He was the sixth person to walk on the moon as well. Mitchell publicly expressed his opinions that he was sure that there were thousands of UFOs recorded since the early 1940s, apparently belonging to other planets. Thousands of them. NBC conducted an interview in 1996 
He talked about meeting with officials from three different countries who said that they had met ETs in person. Quote, the evidence for alien contact is very strong and classified by governments who are covering up visitations and the existence of alien bodies, specifically in places like Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, sorry, do you mind if I just see his credentials one more time? Thank you so much. Number nine, Al Warden. American test pilot, engineer, and NASA astronaut, Alfred Merrill Warden. The pilot for the Apollo 15 lunar missions in 1971. One of the 24 people that have gone to the moon. Woohoo! He orbited it 74 times. Well, he was the first to even drive a moon car. Warden remained at NASA until 1975. And then it gets a little weird. Recently, on a morning show, they asked Warden, why do we keep going back to the moon? He paused and said, quote, survival. Survival of our species. When pressed on aliens, he said, you know, we are the aliens, right? We just think there's somebody else. We're the ones who came from somewhere else because somebody else had to survive. They got in a little spacecraft and they came here and they landed and they started civilization here. And if you don't believe me, go get books on the ancient Sumerians and see what they have to say about it, end quote. <laughs> yeah, that's not uh, terrifying at all, Al. Number eight. James McDivitt. James Alton McDivitt is an American test pilot, Air Force pilot, engineer, and NASA astronaut who flew both in the Gemini and Apollo programs. McDivitt was selected by NASA for the Gemini 4 mission, and in 1965, he saw, filmed, and photographed an object, which approached the Gemini 4 as they were orbiting Earth over Hawaii. Apparently, the UFO had a long arm sticking out of it. Quote, I was flying with Ed, he was sleeping, we were drifting, when suddenly an object appeared in the window, a cylindrical object, white. The film was then sent back to NASA and reviewed by NASA film technicians in 1975. It looked like a white beer can with a pencil sticking out of it. Yeah, he tried for years to get the word out about the phenomenon, but NASA lost those pictures apparently. Oh, that James, he's a, he's a crazy one up there in space with all those degrees he has. What a wacko. Number seven. Dark Side of the Moon, not just an absolute banger of an album, also one of the most terrifying mysterious places in our galaxy, the dark side of our moon. Since the 1950s, NASA has seen and heard some pretty weird stuff back there. See, once you sign that non-disclosure, they kind of own you, you know? Despite what you may have heard, it's true that the Apollo 10 astronauts did hear some interesting sounds behind the moon, described as outer space type music. Audio recordings from the Apollo 10 mission Astronaut Gene Kernan asks John Young if he hears that. Gene calls it music and says it even sounds outer spacey sounding. Young says, we're gonna have to find out about that because nobody's gonna believe us. Hey man, no one believes anyone who's gone up there, so don't take it personally. Astronauts go through visual and audio testing like the Navy SEALs. They know what they're doing. If they say Angel by Shaggy is playing back there, I'm believing them. Number six, Leland Melvin. American engineer and NASA astronaut on board the space shuttle Atlantis, selected by NASA in 1998. This guy's put in time with mission after mission. Melvin has over 565 hours in space. Quite the practice at the whole floating around thing, I'd say. When Leland then was pressed about otherworldly visitors, he said, he had seen something translucent, curved, and organic looking when he was working with fellow astronaut Randy Bresnik. The pair called the ground to ask NASA what it could be, and NASA's response was, eh, probably ice, probably ice. Nice and scientific, Houston. Thanks for that. Mr. Melvin dismissed this and figured it was just NASA's explanation to cover it up. Like, who's more qualified here? That's all I'm asking. When the most qualified people are like, yeah, I can't tell if that's frozen water or a spaceship. Either they shouldn't be up there at all, or they need some more Windex on those windows, NASA. Number five, Ivan Wagner. Astronaut Ivan Wagner was on the ISS as a first timer in 2020. You think they like do trades initiations to the rookies up there? Like no gravity and buckle you when you sleep? Ah. What do you think? He and fellow Russian Anatoly Ivishnin are working with Chris Cassidy up there, the American commander of said expedition. Wagner was then orbiting the Earth and might have actually captured footage of UFOs, better known now as UAPs. The aurora lights behind Earth's beautiful curves was being recorded and it was seen he labeled the video Space Guests. Wagner then tweeted the vid, the aurora australis near Antarctica and Australia, and then this blob of organized lights shows up. Of course, NASA didn't follow up. Like, what are they gonna say? Uh, yeah, that, that's a swamp gas, birds, balloon, grass, cars, something up there, I don't know. Cut the feed, cut the feed. Number four, moonwalk. Yeah, so apparently the footage our parents and also 650 million people across the globe watched in 1969 
It was not the original footage. Hold up, hold up, what? Yeah, apparently what everyone saw on every television set across the globe wasn't as 4K as NASA's end. A man by the name of Gary George came across some very, very old tapes that might be proof as to what NASA sees and what they hear on their end. It's a little different than what we see. Gary George bought 218 surplus government tapes, three reels labeled Apollo 11 EVA. He auctioned them at Sotheby's, first generation of the moonwalk. So hold on, NASA just had a clear copy of this the whole time? I get it, maybe they had a bigger budget. I'm thinking so we can't see what's in the background or what's flying in the background, or any stars in the background. Yeah, I just wonder how long it's gonna take before Robert Bigelow or Tom DeLonge get their hands on that. Hey mom, there's something in the background, guys. Pay attention. Number three, Gordon Cooper. Leroy Gordon Cooper Jr. was an American engineer, test pilot, US Air Force pilot, and the youngest of the seven original astronauts in Project Mercury. You know the pictures, it's the old school tin foil suits. 1963, Cooper piloted the longest and last Mercury space flight, Mercury Atlas Nine. 34 hours in space. The first American to spend an entire day in space, the first to sleep in space, and in Cooper's autobiography, Leap of Faith, he recounted his relationship with the Air Force and NASA and their relationship to the UFO conspiracy. Cooper claimed to see his first UFO while flying over Germany. He said that there were hundreds of reports made by pilots, many coming from military on radar. In 1978, he even testified before the United Nations on the topic. Radar operators, fighter pilots, fellow astronauts. He was a strong advocate for disclosure up until his passing. Number two, lost in space. During the 60s, the space race was on between the Americans and the Russians. Like a good old hockey game, huh? Those two, always at it. The first to figure it out what it is to put something or someone up in a little metal box. It was actually the Soviets that secured many of the early victories. While NASA's efforts were widely publicized, of course, sometimes the Soviets made it a point to never announce a mission until days after it was completed. And of course, successful. This allowed them to maintain control over information. Enter stage right, the Giudica Cordiglia brothers from Italy. Former amateur radio operators who apparently caught Russian audio recordings which allegedly proves the Soviets covered up cosmonauts' failed missions in the early 1960s. Apparently she's saying, help, help, I feel hot, am I going to crash? Uh, yo, that is absolutely horrifying. If this is the real deal and the Soviets sent a woman into space that maybe didn't come back, this proves that whatever happens in space stays in space. We're only told what we're supposed to hear. Number one, Buzz Aldrin. American astronaut, engineer, fighter pilot with a doctor of science in astronautics. This guy is overqualified. Three spacewalks in 1966, Gemini 12 mission. As the lunar module Eagle pilot on the 1969 Apollo 11 mission, he and mission commander Neil Armstrong were the first two to land on the moon. There was something out there close enough to be observed and what it could be, according to Aldrin on Apollo 11 to the moon, he observed a light out of the window that appeared to be moving alongside them. But what could it have been other than another spacecraft from another country or maybe even another world? It was either the rocket that had separated from us or the four panels that moved away when we extracted the lander. After he returned home from his missions, he was convinced that he saw aliens while he was out there. Credentials aside, Guy took a lie detector test, which he passed with flying colors. In an interview with C-SPAN, Buzz talked about the future potential of the Earth's moon for humanity. He added a little extra info that might have ignited the spark to go back regarding a certain monolith on the moon. Quote, visit the moon Phobos of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato object that goes around the moon once every seven hours. When people find out about that, they're gonna say, who put that there? Yeah, I'll be the first one, Buzz. Who did put that there? Number 10, feel the music. There are many odd experiments in history where humans, you know, should have left human elements out of it, like music and illicit substances. I can't say what I wanna say, but you know, it's a bad substance that's white. There you go, paint the image in your head. There you go, we'll move around YouTube's algorithm. Back in 2011, a study was done where rats, or rather a bunch of rats, were all put in a room and on loop, they played a Miles Davis song just over and over again. So they were all on said substances and they were in a room while Miles 
Miles Davis played. This is a science experiment, may I add? Just smooth jazz for these rats all day long. Imagine walking into that room, you're like, huh, what's going on in here? It's kind of fun, dare I say. Well, before the substances were injected into these test subjects, they all seemed to have calm demeanors while Beethoven was playing. But after injected, all the rats were neurologically triggered to that smooth, smooth jazz. They acted differently in a group setting, which is kind of weird. After a full week on the, you know, not so great sauce, the rats were all of a sudden like, you know what? We love Miles Davis now. We changed our minds. So yeah, illicit substances changes how you listen to music, apparently, if you're a rat. Any rats watching, hit that thumbs up with your little rat hands. Number nine, the first pregnancy test. If you're looking past the ancient Egyptians and their use of barley and urine to determine if somebody's pregnant, you'll often land on this experiment from the 1930s. It's pretty close. It's heavily inspired. It was developed in 1931 by Maurice Friedman at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Now, what would happen here is doctors would inject a rabbit with urine from a woman who was suspected of being pregnant and the rabbit's ovaries could easily tell if that was the case. Accurate, yes. Historical, change the game, why of course. Would it also end up with the rabbit passing away every single time? Yes. It's sad, more often than not, when humans are involved in any medical process, but you know, we're trying. We're trying to, you know, not do that anymore. We're doing pretty good. All those furs were like, nah, get out of here. Number eight, Kunga. Perhaps the earliest example of human-animal hybrid testing. Here we go. Scientists recently learned about this donkey hybrid that once roamed ancient Mesopotamia. This was a long time ago. This was before horses had even arrived to land, so they had to do something, right? They needed help pulling stuff. So large Kungas would step in and they would pull wagons and smaller Kungas would help pulling plows. These little guys were the talk of the town. Imagine a hybrid animal before horses. No wonder they were a status symbol, come on. 4,000 years ago, they were given as gifts for weddings. Yummy, can you imagine that? I think it's a kunga. It smells like a kunga. I think it's definitely a kunga. After so long, scientists are finally able to figure out what exactly a kunga was a hybrid of. This whole time, it was a female donkey and a male Syrian wild ass. Put them together, what a wild time. It's wild what you still learn about ancient animal bones from thousands and thousands of years ago. More amazing how involved this hybrid was in Mesopotamian culture. I don't know, should we bring back the kunga? Kind of neat, Kunga Uber. I would take those, hop in a little cart. Number seven, human cow eggs. Okay, we had a few giggles with uh, that one. Time to get into some real dark science stuff. Back in 2008, hybrid research was being done. Human animal hybrid research obviously was being done because of course. The whole idea was to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. Now, I like these projects because we're moving forward at least, or we're trying to. We're trying to find a solution in some way, shape, or form, right? The road's gonna get a little dirty, but we'll figure it out. Otherwise, we don't need to be poking around cows, you know what I mean? Nobody needs three bowls of cereal before gym class anymore. Those days are over. There's other ways to wake up. I would do the beep test, I almost throw up every single day. Yeah, I would just have a full bowl of cereal, then just go to class and like play baseball all morning. It's like, oh, geez. Scientists used the nucleus of a cow egg. They took it out and replaced that nucleus with that of human and skin cells. Add in a little time and the egg can now develop and turn into a blastocyst, AKA a clone embryo. And there we have stem cells for says science. Again, this is a lovely step, but how far do we go? How much DNA are we gonna mix before, you know, things can go south? For example, like, Number six, monkey head transplant. Okay, here we go. The first ever successful monkey head transplant. Crazy that I'm saying that out loud. This was back in the early 1970s. I imagine some of your parents may have heard of this. I don't know, I bet it would be hard to forget. Ask them. Ask them in the middle of dinner when they're mid-bite. Ask them about the uh, monkey head transplant from the 70s, which is room dinner. American researcher Robert White, he pulled off the you know otherwise impossible in a slow, tedious operation. See, White took the head of one monkey and then attached it to a already headless monkey. Add a little time and energy and some science and voila, this actually worked. Yeah, the monkey actually tried to bite one of the surgeons once it came to life, which, you know, totally fair. I'd probably be a little upset too. Sadly, the monkey passed away nine days later, but like I said, the fact this actually happened, I mean, one, is terrifying, and two, dare I say, it's miraculous. Some sci-fi stuff right here. We're moving heads? We're transferring heads for nine business days? You're gross. Number five. Monkey become human. This next one's a little less hands-on, so, you know, if you have food, now you can probably take a bite. It's probably safe for now. Back in 1931, psychologist Winthrop Kellogg, familiar name, he was curious. He sat up one night out of the blue and thought, you know what, what would happen if a monkey was raised with human beings? Would it end up like that, you know, monkey from MVP? Would it learn to play hockey for the local team? Or would operations go south quickly? The latter happened, yeah, no hockeys are doing any you know, crosses and deeks. It's all bad. Uh, when it comes to animals and science, it's 
pretty bad. It's nothing like the cinema. None of that shit happened at all. Kellogg instead brought a baby female chimp named Gua into his home. Yeah, this man raised the chimp as if it were another human being alongside his own human being son, Donald, which is just a, a wild time growing up. I'd rather you have an imaginary friend than a monkey as a friend. That's pretty dangerous. But they did everything together. They played, they went to bed, they did all their human stuff. The test was working, but it ended abruptly after Kellogg's son, Donald, started to make chimp noises. Yeah, and then everybody was like, you know what? Let's not do that, that was terrifying. Maybe chimps can't learn how to kickflip. Maybe instead humans just go backwards in evolution. So, Guo was then released and no more human best friend. You know, back to, dare I say, normal. I always wanted a monkey best friend growing up. Now I don't, now I really don't. Number four, multi-dog. The multi-dog, yeah, this is gross. This was back in the 50s when a Soviet scientist, Vladimir Demikov, created, um, well, a multi-headed dog. It's pretty easy. Time Magazine covered it. Of course, this is again a feat in science, as disgusting as it is. The adult dog had a newborn grafted to its neck. So when it grew, it could somehow survive off the blood of the main bigger dog. The body, for lack of a better term. Gross. When observed, the puppy did have its own characteristics. It was playful as it growls, just as the other dog's characteristics would be. Now, it is a sad 1950s Soviet animal experiment, so of course that animal didn't survive a very long time. But crossbreeding experiments from hell, this is why we're here, you know what I mean? It's like that three-headed dog from Harry Potter, you know what I mean? Cerberus, I think his name is Cerberus. This, a little more terrifying, a little more jarring, I'd, I'd say, to look at. After you play Harry Potter chess, this thing pops out, you're like, ooh. Never mind, zero points for Gryffindor. Number three, lions. Back in the 1980s at the Chat Beer Zoo in India, they started this experimental program where they would breed together a domestic lion, which is a bit smaller and has a less shaggy mane. They would breed that with an African lion in hopes that they would meet in the middle and be introduced to the wild and somehow help with the dwindling population of wild lions in India. Now on paper, this sounds like a great idea. Dare I say a step forward for the you know, animals and the wild, but it wasn't. Nope, that's why we're here on this list. The zoo found two African lions that were being used in a circus, and then they brought them in to breed with their two Asiatic lions. Now, when the cubs were born, it was clear this is already a mistake, as the cubs had severely weak back legs right off the hop, it wasn't looking good. They were having extreme trouble walking, and as they got older, their immune system started to fail. Now by 2000, they had bred more than 70 of these new hybrid lions, and it was too late, right? They'd finally decided to stop the program, and all the males were then given vasectomies in order to stop any further reproduction. But there were laws that prohibited them from killing any animals, so they were simply just waiting for them to die of natural causes, which, I mean, in this case doesn't really exist. But there's a joint Dwindling population of lions, it's insane to me that they wasted 20 years doing this when they could have just, you know, simply bred the lions that they had with other lions. Probably harder than it sounds, but I mean, I don't know. What the fuck is this? New lions with like Bambi legs? That's way worse. Number two, spider art. Nice. This is like art attack, but terrifying because I hate spiders. Before our number one spot, I have to mention NASA's 1995 spider test. They're a little cool, dare I say. When nature meets science, we often get jarring results, be it hybrid animals, clones, monkeys going on and off, you name it. Spiders, as fascinating as they already are, can be even more mysterious, especially when they're exposed to, how do I say this, mind-altering illicit substances. You got it? NASA wanted to determine the toxicity between all of these substances and what differences they may look like in real life. Now spiders are fascinating. We can see how they think and survive every day. You know, we see it up close. We walk through them and we go P -p 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 -p, right, it's right in your face. But we never see them like this before. Caffeinated behavior is all over the place when it comes to their web. It doesn't look like a normal web at all. But with hallucinogens, it's the same shape of a web, but it's almost missing steps. I don't think any animal should also have coffee, you know, let alone Hallucinogens, my God, no way. Also, I can't even have coffee. I'm crazy when I have coffee, let alone any of this shit. And finally, number one, the mouse with an ear on its back. Yeah, the title says it all. I could say that and we could be done here, but I think I have to explain a bit more. If we ever reboot Stuart Little, this guy has to audition. Let's do it. A live action, are you kidding me? He'd f it up. Back in 1997, this Bacanti mouse became the test subject to determine if scientists could grow cartilage using chondrocytes, AKA cells from a cow. Well, it worked and we're still talking about it. I'm still talking about it, obviously, I mean, Look at this. Now it all started when Joseph Vicanti, pediatric surgeon, he began designing human organs. Now this was during a shortage. He wasn't just born and you know, started to make ears like a serial killer. No, he was changing the medical game. And little did he know, he was about to change the science game as well. He constructed a regular looking ear and he told his brother Chuck and his partner Bob to not bring up the fact that he attached said ear 
to a live mouse. Now, that's a pretty hard secret to keep, I imagine, so Chuck ended up spilling the beans. Now everybody knows, but at the same time, now we all know that cow cartilage can create cells, which is pretty good, that's pretty good science. Can grow ears. I wanna Q-tip his ear back thing, you know what I mean? <laughs>